You may be seated, friends. I want to welcome you all to worship today. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so excited that you came out to worship Jesus here at Stillwater Church today. We've been talking about what it means to resolve everyday conflict, something that we all deal with, and as we get better and better at this, it helps us to look more and more like Jesus Christ, and that's why it's so important, uh, re- by, because by handling conflict well, uh, we become more and more the people that God's calling us to be. Uh, today we're going to look at, at kind of how our pride can get in the way of resolving conflict, because that's certainly a big factor that we have to deal with. Um, As we begin, why don't we take just a moment and pray together. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? God, we want to give you thanks for the many amazing blessings that you have given Stillwater Church. Would you have blessed us beyond belief, and, and we are just in awe of your kindness to us, God. Most of all, God, I just give you thanks that you have given me as their pastor. This congregation of really messed up people really needs a great and gifted leader like me. For when they're out there living in their sin and foolishness, I'm here setting the high bar of you'd, how you would want them to live. Lord Jesus, they can't see you, but they sure can see me, and that's just about as good. But most of all, God, I just I want to give you thanks for my humble heart. In spite of all the reasons I could be arrogant, I remain nothing but, but humble and, and awesome. Amen. You know, if you missed last week here at 9.30, you missed a great opportunity to see just how awesome I am, and I wanted to revisit that on video for you in case you missed it. Let's check it out. You know, as I look at this stuff in comparison to what Jesus has forgiven me, there's a fairly natural response. I... (laughs) practiced all week too. So if you missed church last weekend, yeah, you missed me missing a trash can. But but for the record, I did go two for three on the weekend, which, yeah, that, right. <laughs> if I were shooting three pointers, that would be good, right? Point blank range, not so impressive. Well, hey, if my prayer this morning was a little concerning to you, then you'll appreciate this story that Jesus told. Luke chapter 8, verse 9. Jesus told the story of some who had great self-confidence and scorned everyone else. Okay, so that's who he's talking to. People who have great self-confidence, so they look down on others. Jesus says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a dishonest tax collector. Okay, so if you're here in Jesus' day, you're hearing this story, you've already kind of made your decision as to who the winner and the loser will be in this story. And for us, it's a little bit messed up because when we hear Pharisee, we oftentimes think, ooh, bad, right? You know, because we know Jesus condemned them a lot. But in really, Pharisees as a whole were very good guys. I mean, they followed the law a little too closely, uh, but they were generous. They, they, they certainly focused their attention on God. They would have been a very respected group of, pe- of people. So when we say Pharisee, they're going to say, okay, that's a good guy. But when Jesus says, and then there was this tax collector, that's where everybody's booing, right? We hate tax collectors. They stink. They, they stole from the people. They had sold out their countrymen. They were, they were collecting taxes for, for the uh, Roman Empire who was occupying them. They weren't happy about that. So we know that the Pharisee must be the good guy and the tax collector must be the bad guy in this story. It's, a, it's just a classic like good guy and villain kind of story. But this isn't exactly how it's going to go. There's, so that we're going to tell the story of these two people. It says this, The proud Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. So he comes to the temple, uh, the place that we, they would worship God, and he kind of comes in front and center, and he's, you know, he's standing you know, facing the front saying, I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everybody else out there, especially like that, that tax collector over there. Then he continues on and he says this, Next slide, please. For I never cheat. I do not sin. I don't commit adultery. I fast twice a week. And I give you a tenth of my income. All good stuff. So here he lists his kind of resume. And the second part of that verse is not too bad. The second part, those are all good things. The problem was the first part. In order to like make himself look good, he has to put down the tax collector. He has to put down others. Thank you, God, that I'm so much better than everybody else. The pride, the arrogance is is so evident 
in, in this man's prayer. And you know, in our lives, pride is at the center of every unhealth, unhealthy conflict. Conflict itself is not bad. We need to have conflict. It's an important part of life. But when we get into unhealthy conflicts, we can almost always trace the problem back to our pride. In fact, those of us who struggle with recurring unhealthy conflicts, I would say that our central problem is a problem of pride and arrogance. It's not a problem only of, of conflict or of, of temper or this, that, and the other. Those may be all issues. But the central issue comes down to our pride and our arrogance, much like we see this Pharisee. And this Pharisee, he belittles God's child in order to make himself look better. It's like he's trying to love God without loving others. And we already know that doesn't work. The Bible says you can't do that. That if we say that we love God, we don't love others, that we're lying. It's just simply not possible. Well, the tax collector approaches God in a very different way. Verse 13, this tax collector stood at a dis distance, dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. So he's kind of over here off to the side all by himself, right? While the Pharisee's front and center, he's off to, his, off to the side. In our terms, he's probably down on his knees, right? And he just simply says, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. That's it. He doesn't even ask for forgiveness, if you notice. Forgiveness would probably be a higher level, saying, God, can we make, you know, make me in right relationship with you? He just says, don't punish me as bad as you could. I'm a sinner, and I know it. Now, if we're in Jesus' day, and we're going to play the game of who gets forgiven at church today, we'd probably favor the Pharisee. But Jesus says, no, that's not how it is. Verse 14, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. Why? Because the proud will be humbled, but the humble will be honored. Let's be clear, this tax collector, not a good guy. Not a good guy at all. He, he cheats, he steals, he's all sorts of bad things. But the part that makes us squirm a little bit is that the arrogance of the Pharisee, who's generally a good guy, is actually less acceptable to God than the humility of the bad guy. God honors this prayer of the worst sinner, if you will, over the prayer of the better person, if you will, because of the issue of arrogance. The Pharisee is so busy looking down his nose at others. And, you know, it's easy for us to, to hear that and say, yeah, bad Pharisee, you, you shouldn't do that. We, we know better. But it's easy for us to walk that same route. I mean, like, think of it in our context. One thing, uh, if you're new here, one thing that we do at the end of the service is in our closing song, a lot of times we come forward, uh, we, we come over to this side or the other side, we, we light a candle, we say a prayer. It's kind of a, a way of us uh, connecting with God. So you might imagine that, that somebody might come up here after church and, and might uh, light a candle. It's your typical, like, soccer mom or dad, right? Just normal, average person, and they're kind of here saying a prayer and, you know, thanking God for all the good things that God's given them and, and all these various things. And they look over and they see at the kneeling rail somebody different. They see somebody that they've seen on the news. This guy uh, got in trouble. He broke into somebody's house and he stole stuff, sold it. Why? To fuel his heroin addiction. So you've got, you've got soccer mom here and you've got drug addict thief over there. And it's really easy when we're soccer mom here to say, God, thanks that I'm not like that guy. I work hard for my money. I don't break in and steal people's stuff. I take care of my body. I, I don't want to waste my life on those drugs, you know. I mean, I, I've got a family to take care of. And, and thanks, God, that I'm not like that other guy. It's easy. It's really easy to do. Who among us has never had a moment like that where we haven't, even though we didn't say it, in our hearts, look down at somebody else in, in that, that pride, that arrogance. And you know, yet the person here, the person at the kneeling rail just sits there and says, God, <laughs> I'm sorry. I messed up. I'm embarrassed by my sin. I'm humiliated here in our community, and I want to be different. Truth is, I don't know if I'm going to be different. I'm, I'm still wrestling with, I'm, I just, I need you, God. And the Bible tells us that God honors that prayer. 
even more so than the prayer where we're looking down on the other person. And you know, oftentimes in conflict, we get into these unhealthy conflicts because we're so busy looking down on that person beside us, that person that we're in conflict with. We're so sure that for whatever reason, our position is superior to their position, and we don't treat them with the same love and respect that we should do so. We're pretty sure that when we enter conflict, that we're like 95, 98% right, right? So it's the other guy's problem. It's the one who's, you know, got that 2, 3, 4, 5%, you know, that, I mean, you know me having the 2, 3, 4, 5%, I shouldn't be the one to have to resolve this. It should be the 95, 98% guy. But yet that's an arrogant way of looking at it. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 1. Stop judging others and you will not be judged. For others will treat you as you treat them. Whatever measure you use in judging others, it will be used to measure how you are judged. Now this is interesting. This verse gets pulled out of context sometimes. Sometimes folks will use it in a way of saying that it's never right for someone to identify a sin in somebody else's life. That's not accurate. Okay, Jesus is clear, because in other places, Jesus clearly tells us to confront sin in one another's life. The issue is how we do it and, and what those relationships are in which we do it. I mean, there are folks in my life, I've told you before, my accountability buddies who I love very much, they absolutely, we absolutely point out sin in each other's lives. We certainly do. Because that's how we help each other grow. Now, we do it in a loving way, in a non-mean, judgmental kind of way, but we certainly do. We don't do that with the general population, right? God has not made you sin umpire for all of the greater Dayton area. If you thought that was your job, it's not. Okay, so you got some time off here. You don't have to do that for everybody out there. But certainly, the way that we judge others, that gets applied to us. Maybe you've uh, worked with somebody who's that person who, even though they're not really in charge, they think that they're in charge, right? And they go around telling everybody else how wrong they're doing everything. And you know how it is, because then when that sl person slips up, everybody's real quick to point out their fault, right? Because you're so tired of them acting all high and mighty. Because by the measure that we judge others, we get judged ourselves. Jesus teaches this. He says this, Why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own. How can you think of saying, help me get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't get past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log from your own eye. Then perhaps you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. This is a great illustration, isn't it? I mean, Jesus, he comes up with these, the best illustrations, like, have you ever gotten a piece of, like, sawdust in your eye before? Man, I have. That stinks. I was being dumb. I was using my little circular saw, looking down, making sure I'm cutting on the line. But would I put on safety goggles? No, it's just a little cut. I won't have a problem, right? Of course I do. Sawdust right in my eye, and that hurts. That really stinks. And we know that's a problem. So if we see somebody with that little speck in their eye, it's easy to point it out because, of course, it is a problem. But Jesus kind of makes this funny comparison. He says oftentimes when we're going around pointing everybody else for the little specks in our eye, we're missing something. <laughs> and we're going around saying, hey, you got that little speck in your eye where in reality, here's me, right? Going around, hey, you know what? I think, Jimmy, you got something there. Can I? Oh, sorry. I, I, it's, it's right there. If I could just get a little closer, right? I'd get it. Or Dana, I think there's something on your shirt, buddy. I can't. Ridiculous, right? Who on earth would do that? But we do it. Because the truth is, we always think our problems are the little ones. It's everybody else who's got the real issues, right? If only everybody would live as good as me, the world would be so much better. But in reality, we're missing some of these planks. We know this is true because if nothing else, we see it in the lives of others. We see it in our friends, our family members, our co-workers that go around always condemning, always picking on somebody, always picking a fight, always being the one who won't say, say that I'm sorry. And we look at them and say, man, you've got this huge two-by-four in your life. Why doesn't somebody tell you? And Jesus tells us. He says, if you want, before you go pointing out little things in other people's lives, before you go unfairly, unkindly judging others, you really should deal with those big, nasty things in your own life. 
in conflict, we do this a lot. Because we get into these conflicts and we are so sure that we're right and the other person is wrong. And so we escalate and we, we get mean and we say things we shouldn't say. We cause hurt. We cause damage. We, we break friendships. We break uh, marriages. We break up uh, companies. We all sorts of different things because we're so concerned that the other person is wrong and we're standing here with this giant thing in our own eye and we won't say that we're sorry. We won't apologize. And we get upside down about the dumbest stuff. I mean, man, when I think back of the conflicts in my life, I've gotten upside down over some of the dumbest things. Jennifer and I, we got married at 2021, and I remember our first fight was over cereal or waffles for breakfast. Is that stupid? Yes, that's stupid. Gosh, I mean, I remember in, when I started in full-time ministry, my first big conflict in church was over whether our youth group was staying in a hotel or, or a church on mission trip. What a dumb thing to argue about, right? These are not big deals. I bet if you think back to some of your big conflicts, a lot of them started over very little and stupid things. But yet they escalated, they progressed, and they got worse and worse because you wouldn't talk about the log in your own eye. You were so certain that you needed to be right, that you needed to prove the other person wrong, that you needed to point out everybody's faults, that you missed that big, obvious problem. And it's silly, but we do it. In your notes, you'll see that your judgment of faults should begin with you. This is a complete reversal on how the world does it. The rest of the world says, I'm going to point out the problems in everybody else. You need to say that you're sorry. You need to own your stuff. And then maybe I'll think about looking at that stuff. My little problem here. Jesus turns that on its head, as the kingdom of God often does, and says, no, let your judgment of faults begin with you. What if when you entered conflict, you said, what is my job? What is my responsibility to deal with here? What if I were willing to be the one who asks for forgiveness first? Even if you truly believe you're 2% wrong, what if you were the one to own your 2% to ask for for forgiveness? Apologizing is tough. We don't do it well. Because why? We're arrogant. If you struggle to apologize, you're struggling with pride. Because in an apology, I have to say, I was wrong. I messed up. I'm sorry. I ask humbly for your forgiveness. We tend to, even when we apologize, we tend to be arrogant sometimes. Hey, I'm just so sorry that we keep fighting about all these things that you're wrong about. I'm sorry for that. Doesn't work, does it? I'm sorry that you got offended when I had to correct you in front of all of our coworkers. Sorry about that. I'm sorry you didn't get the joke about how your new haircut makes you look like Albert Einstein. You had a better sense of humor. Sorry about that. Sorry you keep getting upset because I take your parking space. Sorry that your nose got in the way of my fist. Do you know all these things? It's not how we should do it. But if you struggle with apology, uh, good news. There's a new product out on the market now that will help you out dramatically. Let's check out this advertisement. Are you sick and tired of having to continuously apologize for things you do wrong? Looking for just the right way to fake your way through all kinds of apologies? Then check out our hot new product, the Fake Apology Player. Instead of stumbling over your words and looking like an idiot, let the Fake Apology Player do all the dirty work for you. I feel terrible that I borrowed your van and returned it with no gas. I didn't realize it got such lousy mileage. I apologize for not being home in time for the delicious dinner you spent hours preparing for me. I realize now it was wrong to stop for that burger, fries, and milkshake. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm sorry you took it as an insult when I called you a loser. Thanks to the fake apology player, you can get away with anything. I see now how wrong I was to have sold your lawnmower. The truth is, I forgot I borrowed it from you. I'm such a scatterbrain. I'm sorry you were waiting for me at the movies and I never met you there like I promised I would. What happened was, something came up that was more fun. I knew you'd understand. 
With the fake apology player, you can even make your mistake look like someone else's fault. I feel just awful that I haven't paid back the money I borrowed from you. It's a shame you didn't remember how irresponsible I am when you loaned it to me. Order yours now, because owning the fake apology player means never having to say you're sorry. It's so obvious when we see it in the lives of others, isn't it? Resolving conflict is really easy when we look at other people. It's a lot more difficult with ourselves. Because there again, that issue of pride, that issue of arrogance gets in the way. What if, if as followers of Jesus Christ, we would be willing to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, for my part in this. I apologize. I want to make this right. I don't want us to get upside down. I don't want us to damage this relationship. It's not worth it. These issues that we're discussing, that we're, we're fighting about, that we're hurting each other about, I wanted to own my stuff. I want to be responsible for that. Because that's what Jesus tells us to do. You know, as I look at the folks in my life who I would say have the most wisdom, the people that I learn the most from, without fail, they're also the people that I know who are the most humble. Why do you think that is? They listen, right? They, they're, they're not afraid to assume that it might be them who has the log in their eye. So when somebody else points something out, instead of putting their hands up and getting defensive, which is our default position, Instead, they say, well, tell me about that. Let, let me learn about that. Let me consider that. It doesn't mean that everybody who says something to you is always right, but that you at least listen, that you take it seriously, that you consider that maybe, just maybe, you might be the one who's wrong. Maybe your preconceived notions about this may be mistaken. Maybe if, if you would stop kidding yourself and behaving like everything is, you're always right and the others are always wrong. Maybe then we could grow more in wisdom. We could grow more to be the kind of people that God is calling us to be. Humble people are the most wise because they've learned this value of listening. If we entered a conflict more concerned about what we were going to hear and listen to than what we were going to say and prove the other one wrong, we'd get a lot farther. We, we so many times don't even listen to one another because instead we're just thinking of what we're going to say next in order to prove them wrong. What if we were people who were, took a more humble approach? said, I want to first understand what you're saying, then seek to be understood in what I'm saying. You know, for all of us, I think this is true because we all have kind of three areas of self-understanding. There's a, a compartment of your life that you know that nobody else knows. There, there's, there's, area, there's parts of your life that just nobody else on the face of this earth, even those closest to you, know about you. Then there's a much bigger compartment and that's the compartment that you know and everybody else knows, too, because it's pretty obvious. We, we, these are our just kind of outward selves. We see that, okay? And a lot of folks think there's just these two compartments. There's the piece that I know, and there's the piece that we know. But the truth is there's a third compartment, and that third compartment is the piece that only you know. There's a piece of me that, that, that you can see that I can't see about myself. And as the, especially our friends, our folks that are closest to us, our spouses, our loved ones, they, they, they see us and they know us and they understand things about us that we may not get ourselves because of this whole log business. Because even the most humble people struggle with these things. We all have these areas where sometimes we don't see it right. And when we're willing to listen and to say, I want to know more about that third category. I don't want to be the guy walking around with the log hanging out of my eye, the, the big two-by-four getting in the way of everything because I won't listen to anybody. Because, you know, when you listen to folks, they're more likely to share those things with you. When you're kind and non-defensive, you'll get a lot more feedback about that. When, when you get a reputation for not listening and just fighting back and putting your hands up and when somebody says something that, you know, you might learn from, instead you swing and jab back at them, you won't learn much. You'll go through life living basically the same life you're living today. You won't grow in wisdom. You won't grow in humility. You won't become the person that God's calling you to be. That's how important it is that we have humility in the way we deal with conflict. And you know, it's not just a negative thing. This, this, this third category that others see that we don't see, we also learn a lot of positives that sometimes we're unaware. 
Like just recently, um, I was helping a friend who was uh, filling out some stuff for a job they were applying for. And uh, me and another friend, were, we were helping this person, just, you know, just basic stuff. And, and so we had written kind of little, you know, nice little things about them. See, that was things that we see in this person's life, life that are positive and good. The funny thing is that we were doing that independently, right? Each of us were writing things about this person, but not consulting with one another. person gets these things back and looks at it, and she says, you guys wrote about the same stuff. Stuff that I wasn't even, some of it I wasn't even aware of. And, and you said pretty much the same, why is that, right? Well, because there's this area that we may not fully see in ourselves, and yet, others see in us and we can learn strengths we didn't even know that we had as a result of this when we have this humility we can learn things both good and painful about ourselves in your notes you'll see that that the first admission of fault tends to trigger an admission from the other person this is interesting because we oftentimes get into conflict saying hey i'm the one who's pretty much right here so i'll you know if i'm right wrong on something i'll apologize once you make your peace right the truth is, more commonly are we willing to listen and to apologize to someone who's humble. So we shouldn't apologize first as an act of manipulation. That's wrong. But just as an act of common sense, it, when you are willing to look more direct of you, at yourself, other people may be more willing to look directly at themselves. Second thing, even if you're only responsible for 2% of the conflict, okay, even if this is right, let's say that you're only responsible for 2%, you are still 100% responsible for your 2%. Okay, that's a lot of percentages, I know. Simply saying, you are fully responsible for your piece of this conflict, no matter how big or small you think it is. No matter how wrong or how right you think you are, you still are responsible for that area in which that you're wrong. And usually in conflict, we've both got something that we need to look at in our own lives. If we're serious about addressing that, God can use it to help us to be more like him. And that's a humility piece. That's that willingness to be humble and to let God change us. In your life, what would that look like? What would it look like for you to be more humble? Maybe there's a particular conflict you're in right now and God's speaking to you, saying you need to address the log first in your own eye. Maybe it's just in a general way in relationships. You're saying, you know, yeah, I, I need to do more of this. I'm going to pray in a moment, and I invite you to to pray with me and to ask God that that he would help you deal with these things in your life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for setting the high bar for us of what it means to be humble in conflict. Lord, we're pretty sure that we're usually right and others are wrong. But the truth is, God, that we all struggle with this. We need you to help us to be more gracious, more kind. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand your forgiveness of of ourselves because it's only through that that we can truly forgive others. And God, when we enter these conflicts, would you help us to have the humility to look at our own eye first, at our own self, before we start pointing fingers at the other person. God, we thank you for what a great example that you gave us in Jesus. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.